Hi, welcome back to my channel. Now, for the longest time, I've been a great fan of science fiction literature. I've read a lot of science fiction books through my life. And I've always been conscious of the fact that many book readers don't go near science fiction. They seem to be either a bit intimidated about, about it or they have prejudices about it, that it's not good literature. You know, that it doesn't give that hit that a good book gives you. I don't agree with this. I think there are many uh, books in the science fiction series which are absolutely beautiful novels, brilliantly written, brilliantly characterised, and very intelligent and thought-provoking. So what I want to do in this video is I want to introduce those of you who don't usually read science fiction to ten novels which I think you will enjoy, and I think could get you into science fiction. And if you already are a science fiction reader, these are ten books that, if you haven't read them, I strongly, strongly recommend. Now the first book I want to talk about is Daniel Key's Flowers for Algernon. This is a book I cannot imagine anyone not liking this book. It's a very simple, straightforward and deeply moving story. It's about a young man who's working in a bakery and he has subnormal IQ. He's, he's got learning difficulties. And a scientist experiments on him and raises his IQ. And the first part of the book is about him discovering knowledge and reading and maths. It's very beautifully written. And then his intelligence keeps going up and up exponentially. And soon he finds that he's actually the most intelligent guy around. And he's way ahead of these other scientists. And suddenly cynicism and contempt starts to build him towards the human race. And then he hits the top and it breaks. And he suddenly realises he's going back down. And his, his, all that intelligence that he's accrued, all that knowledge, is going to vanish. And he's going to go back to stupidity. And it's heartbreaking. It's a very beautiful and heartbreaking story. And once you've read it, the quote that opens the novel from Plato's The Republic will haunt you. And I'll just read it to you. Anyone who has common sense will remember that the bewilderments of the eyes are of two kinds and arise from two causes either from coming out of the light or from going into the light, which is true of the mind's eye quite as much as of the bodily eye. And he who remembers this, when he sees anyone whose vision is perplexed and weak, will not be too ready to laugh. He will first ask whether that soul of man has come out of the brighter life and is unable to see because unaccustomed to the dark, or having turned from darkness to the day, is dazzled by excess of light. And he will count the one happy in his condition and state of being, and he will pity the other. Or, if he have a mind to laugh at the soul which comes from below into the light, there will be more reason in this than in the laugh which greets him who returns from above out of the light into the den. And who can say now we're not all going back into the den? That quote will haunt you after reading this book. It's deeply moving. And it's a very compassionate story that I think would grip anyone. If you're looking for a short, sharp shock, um, something just, just a quick pulp bit of science fiction to get you in the mood, I cannot recommend anything better than Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. This is to the 20th century what Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde was, was to the 19th century. A short novella with a very simple idea but which pierces all the concerns of its age, in this case, the nuclear age. The story is very simple. It's about um, a disease, a pandemic, has spread across the world and everyone in its path has been infected and it turns them into vampires. So this book is of great um, interest to horror readers as well. And only one man is left and he's holed up in his house in this, in this American city you know, and they're trying to get in to get him, and he's he's fending them off, and during the daytime he's killing them, and that's the story. It builds towards an ending, which I think is one of the great twist endings of all literature. It's a good twist ending, not just because you're not expecting it, but also because it completely reframes the way you think about the rest of the novel, and that to me is good writing. Um, it's been adapted three times into a movie. The most famous version is probably now the Will Smith version. Before that, in the 70s, it was adapted into a film starring Charlton Heston, a very schlocky 70s movie, which I quite like. But actually, the best version was the first version, which not many people have seen. It was made in the 60s, a cheapo movie made in Italy by a director whose name I forget, with Vincent Price. It's called The Last Man on Earth. 
The Charlton Heston film is called The Omega Man. But the, the version I like with Vincent Price is called The Last Man on Earth. Hunt it down, it's rather good. But read the book first. Now another one that you may have heard of is The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. This was recently adapted into a big spanking Netflix doc, you know, uh, drama series, uh, which did quite well. This, to me, is still the best novel in what you call alternative Earth scenarios. So, you know, like, what happened, you know, if Winston Churchill had never lived? You know, what happened if the American Revolution had never taken place? And this is the old classic, you know, what happened if the Nazis had won, right? And so this book is set a few years after the Second World War. The Nazis had won. And America has been divided between the Germans and the Japanese. Now, I know this is an old chestnut uh, about the, the Nazis winning, but I don't think anyone has done it with as much intelligence um, and as much um, subtlety as Dick does it in this book. He gets all the, all the horrors of fascism are present and correct, but he also shows the, just the, the real everyday life of people trapped in this society. He looks at it through four characters. One is an antique stealer who deals in old Americana before the Nazi invasion. Another is a, a, one of his clients who is a Japanese businessman. Then another character is someone who's actually faking antiques for the market. And the fourth character is his girlfriend. And it follows their journeys across this new America. And brilliantly at the centre of it is a rebel, you know, hidden in the depths of the country, who's writing a book which does a counterfactual what if the Allies had won the war? And that becomes the sort of central idea of the book. It's ingenious. A brilliant read for anyone, whether you're a science fiction fan or not. I can't recommend it highly enough. But if you like alternative Earth scenarios, and I love them, this is a real curious one. It was written by an English writer called Keith Roberts. It's called Pavan. And it has a very unusual scenario. The idea is that the Spanish Armada won. They took over England. Elizabeth I is assassinated and England remains a Catholic country. And Roberts projects forward that this means that the Industrial Revolution doesn't really happen. You know, there's no British Empire. And Britain, as, as Europe, remains in a sort of quasi-medieval state where people are still communicating through semaphore on top of hills. And rather than modern technology, they'd still have little steam trains carrying everything everywhere. It's a little bit Brexit, you know, those dastardly Europeans keeping the British down, but still. Anyway, so it's a fascinating novel. And Roberts imagines this world so brilliantly with beautiful prose, the vignettes of people's lives, you know, one vignette is about this young guy learning to be a semaphore agent. Another one is about a haulier hauling his goods across the Devonshire Moors. Another is about a priest who's involved in the Inquisition, which is still ongoing. They're described so beautifully and with such tactility and realism. You really feel you're in this world. And that's the joy of this book rather than its sort of narrative momentum. It's a real one-off. I've never read anything quite like it. Very special book if you want to try something a bit different. It's called Pavan because the book is like a dance where it's not one narrative going forward, but a series of vignettes that sort of, sort of um, complement each other and uh, talk about each other. Another well-known writer in the world of science fiction is Brian Aldiss. And Brian Aldiss is one of those writers that straddles the gap between science fiction and more conventional literature. He's a very good writer with very good feel for character. Um, and very intelligent in his use of form. I particularly love this book. It is quite a grim book, as the cover will give you a clue. It's got the same basic idea as P.D. James's Children of Men, that basically because of an, an accident in the atmosphere, humanity has become sterile, and can't, women can't have children anymore. And we, we join the action as the youngest people at the time of this accident have now in their 50s, and they are the youngest people on the planet, so the whole planet is turning geriatric and is falling to pieces. And it starts in this England, which is just falling back into ruralism, and nature is taking over. And Brian Aldous has a really carnivalesque imagination. He really imagines the depravity and the depths every, everyone is sinking into. 
And this 50-year-old couple decide to take a journey down the Thames um, in search of hope, in search of a new era, or anything really that could change the world. And Aldis intercuts this with flashbacks to their previous life, but brilliantly what he does is he intercuts the flashbacks in reverse order. So the first flashback is to the immediate past, but then it goes back to when they first met, and then it goes back right at the end, just at the end of the novel, to when they were children themselves. It's a brilliant exercise in structure. This book really had an impact on me. It really made me think about the importance of children and the way that they replenish society. That's what the book is really about. And as someone who never married and never had children, it made me think about my life choices. It was one of those few books I've read in my life that actually made me sort of stop and think, you know. It's, it's a very beautiful paean to children and their importance in life. It's also a beautiful book, a very rare book, especially in science fiction. The main uh, protagonists are a couple who are in their 50s and they are still in love. It's a portrait of mature love. You don't very often see that. And you don't very often see it in science fiction, which is usually geared towards younger people. But it's a very, one of, the, one of the secret joys of this book is its portrait of a middle-aged couple who are still in love and still care about each other and looking at that tenderly and intelligently within a science fiction narrative. And that's one of the reasons I strongly recommend it. Another major writer in science fiction you, you may have heard of is Ursula Le Guin. She's best known, I think, in Britain for her Earthsea trilogy, which was a, a fantasy trilogy, a bit like Lord of the Rings. I remember being given that to read when I was a kid. But she was an exceptional science fiction writer. I would argue that her science fiction is actually superior. Now, most people recommend The Left Hand of Darkness. I'm going to recommend this book, The Lathe of Heaven, because it's such fun. It's got a brilliant idea that there's this guy, he has these incredibly vivid dreams, but when he wakes up, the world has changed according to his dream, and only he can remember. No one else can remember what the world was like yesterday. In desperation, he goes to see this psychiatrist and tells him, and the psychiatrist thinks, aha, hmm, this is good. I could try and hypnotise him or force him to think in a way that I want the world to be. And that's, that's the idea of the novel. It's a brilliant idea. And Le Guin investigates it with real intelligence and verve. It's, it's really good pulp fiction uh, with very strong characters and very strong comment on modern America. I can't recommend it enough. If you find that you like this book, try The Dispossessed, uh, which I think is probably Le Guin's best piece of science fiction, which is more of a sort of political allegory, a kind of Cold War allegory, about this scientist caught between two planets, one of whom is anarchist and sort of resembles Soviet Russia, one of which is capitalist and re resembles America. It sounds a bit dry, it's actually beautifully written and very well characterised. Within science fiction circles, Robert Silverberg is very well known. Um, Silverberg is a very strange, quite dark, quite tough writer. And this is his toughest book. It's not really a work of science fiction at all. It was written in 1970, it's set in 1970, and it's about four college kids who are at Harvard or Yale or somewhere like that. And one of them is an antiquarian, and he discovers that there's a group of monks in the Nevada desert who are actually descended from this group of 13th century monks who believed that they had the power of immortality. And he becomes obsessed with trying to find them and getting immortality. And he persuades his three friends to go on this road trip with him to this monastery. The first part of the book is about the road trip going towards this monastery and what their hopes and dreams and desires are. And the book goes from one narrator to another. So you go through all four boys and what they're thinking. And Silverberg does not pull his punches. You know, young men, what's going on in their minds can sometimes be quite horrible. And my God, he lets you know it. I mean, their thoughts about sex, their prejudices, it's all, all the gory entrails are out in this book. It's not a book for those who are easily offended, but it's very true, I think, of young men, their ego and sometimes their aggression. 
And in the second half of the book, they find this monastery it actually exists. They find these weird monks. But the monks have a law that only two people can have immortality. And of the other, the other two, one of them has to voluntarily give their life away, commit suicide, and the other one has to be murdered. It's a gruesome, horrible, crappy book. Um, it looks at the worst sides of human nature. But I think it's a book that's well worth reading. And why? Because the real subject of this book is not immortality. It is religious fundamentalism. And I think Silverberg understood it very well. And there is a question that one of the boys asks himself at the end of the book that will stay with you after you've read it. And that's what the book is really about. On a sort of lighter note, this book, Gregory Bentford's Timescape, I, I bought this, I didn't have much hopes for it actually, and you know what, it's become one of my favourite novels in the series. All of these books, by the way, are in the Sci-Fi Masterworks series from Galanks, so they're easily available. Now this book, it's um, a very unusual book in the science fiction series. What it's about, he wrote it in 1980. And he set it 16 years in the future in the 1990s. And in the 1990s in this world, there's an environmental disaster, right? So it's, it's a bit ahead of its time. And this fertiliser has got into the system and is polluting the seas and is killing all the plankton. So all the ecosystem is dying. And this Cambridge scientist designs a way of sending messages through uh, particles, tachyon particles, back into the past to say, look, don't use this fertiliser to avert this world catastrophe. And so we keep flipping between this time zone and the 1960s, where this scientist in California, this New York Jewish scientist, is a bit of a fish out of water in California in the 60s. He's got a Californian wife. He starts getting these signals, and he can't quite believe it. And he starts telling his colleagues, and they all think he's crazy and he's a crank, and he starts losing his respect. And so you flip between this world where the world is ending, and this scientist trying to understand what the hell is going on. And what's brilliant about this is, you know, we're used to these apocalyptic scenarios, aren't we, where scientists are trying to save the world. But it's all done in this kind of, you know, American movie style, where they're all good-looking, and they're all sort of, come on, we've got to sort the problem, and all this sort of stuff. Benford was a physicist. He was a university physicist. And what he's interested in is portraying scientists as they really are. What is the actual mechanics of being a scientist in a university, in a department? What's your relationship with your other colleagues? How do you get something done? How do you, you know, get a government department to back you and all this sort of thing? It's a very realistic portrait of saving the world. It's not an American blockbuster, but it's, it's almost like a soap opera. And I mean that in a positive way, not in a derogatory way. It's, it's like a soap opera. And you get involved with these scientists and their wives, their partners. And there's a very moving saga about the, the man in England who's trying to save the world. He's a very dull, ordinary scientist. And his wife doesn't really understand what's going on. And then this quite sexy guy arrives from the government department in London and he seduces her. And actually... It's kind of horrible. These like men, people's lives are falling apart in desperation, and you, you know. But but Benford sticks instead of you know making it a Hollywood drama, he sticks with the realism, this realist social drama, this soap opera of these people and their lives, and it's it's so rewarding. It, it's so involving. I loved it, and the, the ending is so moving. It's a it's a happy ending, but it's very moving. And I really recommend it for people who are sick and tired of, you know, bombastic sci-fi with loads of special effects. This is the antidote, and I think you'll enjoy it. The next book I want to recommend, I don't have a hard copy of it, um, is one of the most extraordinary novels I've ever read. It is Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban. Russell Hoban was an American who'd had some writing success in the 60s and early 70s, and then he moved to England... And he was a complete Anglophile, and he completely sort of saturated himself in English culture and folklore. Halfway through reading this book, I had no idea it was written by an American. I couldn't believe it when I found out. The book is very strange. It's a post-apocalyptic novel. It's set 
many, many years, centuries after a nuclear war. And Britain has regressed to sort of pre-medieval times, you know, people sort of toiling in the soil around all the bric-a-brac of the old civilization. And what they've tried to do is they've tried to piece together the history because they've lost so many books, they've lost so many documents. And they're trying to piece together the history up to the nuclear war. And they've got it wrong because they've only got certain things to read from. And the peculiarity of the novel is this. The state, the people in charge, they spread this history and their law through Punch and Judy shows. It, it's so bizarre. It, it's such a brilliant but wacky idea. And the main character of the book is a young boy in this village who, because of the, the life expectancy, has suddenly finds himself as the headman of the village. But he doesn't believe the official history. And he runs away from the village to find out the truth. And he sets up an alternative Punch and Judy show, giving an alternative truth. So it's all about fake history, fake news. It's a book that's become more interesting in a way, more relevant as it's got older. But the true genius of the book is that the whole thing is written in this decayed, fractured, eroded English. So language has changed. And as the world has, has, has sort of become darker and more primitive, so language has decayed and we become more primitive. And the whole book is written in this new language. And that's the genius of it. Because you're trying to understand this language. You're trying to read through it to understand what's happening. Exactly as these people, right, are trying to read through the bric-a-brac of ancient civilization to understand what happened. You are at one remove as they are at one remove. Content mirrors form. And it's beautifully sustained. It's brilliantly sustained. So cleverly written. There's no other book like it. When it was first published, it was treated more as literature than science fiction, which I think it is in a way. And I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a difficult book, but it's so rewarding. Now, all these books I've talked about so far are books that... I've geared towards people who want to read some, a science fiction book that is, it's not steeped in science fiction. You don't have to know the law of science fiction to understand them. But I thought I'd finish with a real hardcore, hard sci-fi novel. You want a real hit, a sugar hit of science fiction ideas. This is the book to read. Inverted World by Christopher Priest. God, I love this book. I could not love it more. I don't want to tell you too much about it because the joy of the book is working out what the hell is going on. It's set on another world. And in this world there's a young boy and he lives in a city. And before you get to a certain age, before you become a man, you cannot leave the city. You're in this creche. Now he's become a man. So he goes outside and he finds that the city is a lot smaller than he realised. And the city is winched along on rails. And he has to take part in creating these rails and setting them down and winching the city along. I don't want to tell you any more than that. Already I'm spoiling it. Um, why is the city winched along on rails? What's going on? Why, is, why are they desperately keeping the city moving? What's it running away from? This book... The ideas are so brilliant. I think people might find it really so far-fetched that they might not be able to take it. But if you're a lover of science fiction ideas, science in general, it, it's, it's just catnip. It is a joy. I love the ending. Some people reject the ending of this book. I love it. And again, like with I Am Legend, part of the reason I like the ending of the book is it changes your whole conception of what the novel was about in the first place. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It's simple and cleanly written, and the ideas are ingenious. I've recommended Christopher Priest before on this channel, so before I go, I'll also recommend The Prestige, which is a fantastic page turn. It was turned into a novel by Christopher Nolan. It's a bit simpler than Inverted World, if you, you know, don't fancy something so hardcore. It's about two warring magicians in Victorian London. It's a blast. It's a real page turner. Uh, I can recommend this for a holiday read. Okay, so there's ten novels there um, 
that I think might get you into science fiction and show you the joy of this genre. It's not all spaceships and people with silly names. There's some great stories with great characters, and I really hope you enjoy those books. Thanks very much.